Let's go. I don't think that's the next one. We're going to talk about sanctity of life and pro-choice. Sanctity of life versus pro-choice. And this is probably the most important message. And I tell you, my heart is really, really, really burdened for our country. It is really burdened. Let's start here with the first verse in Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 and 17. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded him, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat it, you will surely die. Let's pray. Father God, we just ask that you would bless the reading and the preaching of your word. And Father, my heart is heavy this morning. My heart is heavy, oh God, for, for the 44 million unborn babies that have been aborted in the United States since Roe v. Wade became legal. And God, my, my, heart is, my heart is broken for this and my heart is burdened for this country, God. Because, Lord, I feel like we're on the precipice of something good, that something would, be, would change, oh God. But, Lord, we're also, we could be we're on the precipice of something absolutely horrible happening in this country. And, Father, oh, I'm asking you to anoint this message, God. And I ask that you would uh, let there be an open heaven between you and these people, that divine revelation would come straight from your throne room, straight to these folks' heart. And Father, I just ask that you would help me to preach this morning. And Father, may every person be able to say, it has been well, it has been good to be in the house of the Lord. So Father, we just ask for just a move of your Holy Spirit today. In Jesus' name. Help me, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. First thing is this. Lies kill. Uh, I've got a, a letter that came uh, last month, and, and I kind of, from our district, our general superintendent, Doug Clay, and, and this is a section of the letter, and and I thought some of the topics that he covered were very important, and so I, that's what I made this series on. I just felt like God said, we need to address these things. Sanctity of life, he wrote, all life is sacred and a gift from God. From conception through death, all life is to be valued, nurtured, and protected. Unfortunately, our culture doesn't recognize this. According to the Pro-Abortion Gut Marker, Gut Marker Institute, a staggering 18.4% of U.S. pregnancies, excluding miscarriages in 2017, ended in abortion. That's nearly one in five new lives are snuffed out before their first breath. May God have mercy on us. Beyond the womb, we honor God when we engage and care for children and foster care and the need and the need for adoption. According to the Department of Health and Human Services, more than 8,000 child placing agencies are faith based. And that's a fact to celebrate. But there's so much more that we can can and should be done. The needs are great. I guess that's why my, my heart is heavy today. And uh, I wish I had a, a joyful message, but uh, um, I, think, uh, I, just, I think this is a very important topic. Here's the first point under the introduction is this. Satan is the father of all lies. Genesis 3, 4, he said, You will surely not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows when you eat, with your eating, God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Here's a couple of points here is this is we are bound to God by faith in his word in abs the word is absolute truth. 
Satan's ploy is to get us to doubt God's word. And one of the basic sins of humankind is unbelief in God's word. It is believing that somehow God does not really mean what he says about salvation, righteousness, sin, and judgment and death. I don't know about you, but I think today there is a concerted effort. There is a concerted effort to send forth lies in our culture. And they all come from the father of lies. The second thing I want you to know about this is Satan murdered us all by a lie. Satan is the greatest mass murder ever. John 8, 42, 47, Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and Jesus said to them, If God were your father... You would love him, for I came from God and now am here. I have not come on my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you were unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, For there is no truth in him, and when he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a what? A liar. And the father of what? Lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? He who believes in Uh, belongs to God, hears what God says, and the reason you do not hear that is that you do not belong to God. With one lie, Satan killed all of us. One lie. Surely, surely not. God didn't really mean what he said. Wouldn't you like to punch him in the throat? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How, I mean, the older I get, the more I hate the devil, because every morning, I, it just, he reminds me. You know, little aches and pains here and there. Here are some of Satan's greatest hits. It's a choice. It's not a baby. Those cops deserve to die. Some lives are worth more than other lives. One of the biggest lies is that life is not sacred. Genesis 1, 27, this is the whole premise of this message is here. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Point number one is this, sacred. We are made in God's image. We are made in God's image. What does that mean, to be made in God's image? First of all, is is this, is like God, therefore, we are sacred. Like God, therefore, sacred. Ephesians 4, 24 says, And to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You were created to be like God. You were created to have a moral likeness to God. You were, you, uh, your original purpose, Adam and Eve's original purpose, was to be sinless and holy, possessing wisdom, a heart of love, and the will to do right. But through Jesus, we can be like God again. Amen? Natural likeness to God. Genesis 2, 19 and 20 says, Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the fields and the birds of the airs. He brought them to, uh, to the man to see what he would name them and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam... No suitable helper was found. Praise God that he made Eve. Amen. How many could say amen for that? All the men say amen. 
Amen. Amen for my wife. Amen. Uh, Philippians 2, 7. But made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. The third point is this, physical makeup. It is in God's image in a way not true of animals. God gave to human beings the image in which he was to appear visibly to them and the form uh, that his son would one day assume. One of the points here is this, is that there is God has created all of us to look kind of to look like him. And uh, Jesus came and took a form like us so we might recognize him. Here's the second point is this murder is capital punishment. Murder is a capital punishment. Genesis 9, 6 says, Whoever sheds the blood of a man, by man shall his blood be shed. For the image of God has made man. For the image of God has God made man. By emphasizing that humans have been uh, created in his image and that, uh, and, and, and that their lives are sacred in his in his sight and by instituting capital punishment commanding that every murderer be punished with death if you take somebody's life if you kill somebody if you murder somebody the you that person's life is sacred and the only way that you could possibly atone for that is probably through your own death that's pretty serious. My life doesn't belong to me. Look at Ezekiel 16, 20 through 22. And he took your sons and your daughters whom you bore to me and sacrificed them as food to idols. Uh, was, was, your, was your prostitution not enough? You slaughtered whose children? my children, and sacrifice them to idols, to the idols. In, in all your detestable practice and your prostitution, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare and kicking about in your own blood. Point number two is this, precious. My children, they're precious. I looked for a... Um, I, I found this article, and it was written by um, Walt Blackman, and he is a, uh, a representative in the, in the, uh, in the House of uh, Arizona, the Legislative House in Arizona, and he wrote this back in February, and I'd like to read this to you, and uh, that's his handsome picture right there. And uh, he, he entitled this, Abortion, the Overlooked Tragedy for Black Americans. During February, which is Black History Month, it is a good time to take a look upon the triumphs and tragedies in African American history. Movies like Harriet tell heroes of the Underground Railroad and the struggle against slavery. It is good to honor those stories. There is, however, one tragedy of the African-American community that is often overlooked. That tragedy is illegalized abortion. Abortion impacts African-Americans at a higher rate than any other population group. In 2011, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention released an abortion surveillance report. According to that report, black women make up 14% of the childbearing population, yet 36% of the abortions were obtained by black women. At a ratio of 474 abortions per, per 1,000 live births, Black women, women have the highest ratio of any group in the country. That's one-third of every, bra every, every black child, one-third of them are aborted. That, 
That is a holocaust. When you use these percentages, it indicates that of the over 44 million abortions since 1973, Roe versus Wade Supreme Court ruling, 19 million black babies were aborted. African Americans are just under 13% of the United States population. White women are five times less likely to have an abortion than a black woman. Perhaps it is a matter of availability. A study by Protecting Black Lives in 2012 found that, get a hold of this, 79% of Planned Parenthood surgical abortion facilities are located within walking distance of a minority community. You, you know, I, Janice and I lived in Sacramento. She grew up in Sacramento. And I know that, you know, we did ministry in poor communities and things like that. And this is, I have more to read here. And it's, it's even more heart gut wrenching. But I know this one thing is sometimes in poor communities, they can't keep a grocery store, but they can keep a Planned Parenthood there. Something is wrong with our culture. Something is wrong with our society. In the past, we criticized the tobacco industry for targeting young people with their advertising. Recently, the nicotine vape industry has been criticized for similar practices. The prevalence of abortion providers in African-American and Hispanic neighborhoods indicates the abortion industry is targeting too. It smacks of the eugenics linked uh, past of Planned Parenthood founder Margaret Sanger, who is an extreme racist, and her views of contraception and abortion as ways of diminishing the black population. The impacts of our black communities are hard to fathom. According to the Guttmacher Institute, which generally supports abortion, in 2011, 300 and, uh, 360,000 black babies were aborted. CDC statistics for 2011 show that 287 and 72 black deaths occurred in all causes excluding abortion. By those numbers, abortion is the leading cause of death among blacks. Can you believe that? That same year, Dr. Kermit Gosnell, an abortionist in the Philadelphia area, was arrested. His arrest followed a raid on a clinic, uh, the Drug Enforcement Administration. Agents were acting on the suspicion that he had been over-prescribing oxycodone. But once inside the clinic, they were shocked to find female patients writhing on tables in a facility that was littered with feces and a flea-ridden cat that uh, could roam free inside the premises. Dr. Gosnell was eventually charged with the murder of a woman that had died in a botched abortion and for several live birth abortions that where he had killed babies born alive. It is outrageous that it took a drug raid to finally bring the authorities to look at this house of horrors. You would think that such a horrific occurrence would be a big news story. And when it went to trial, the press gallery was empty, and Kermit, and Kermit Gos, Gosnell abortion mill was in a black community. The news media did not care. A movie was released about Gosnell's trial in 2018, despite being produced by known Hollywood actor Dean Cain, Clark Kent, Superman, in the show, Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman, the Gosnell trial movie had a hard time finding theaters to show it. It is <clears throat> undeniably good that we convey the positive stories of our community to our fellow countrymen. It is also important that we pass on the stories that empower us. However, it is harmful to all black Americans if we continue to let society look the other way. 
when it comes to the devastation that political policies like abortion wreak on the black community. Here's point number one under point number two. Your children belong to God. Your children belong to God. God, um, this verse, sons are a heritage from the Lord. Children are a reward to him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. Adam has a good quiver full, right? So, amen. Thank you, Valerie, for his quiver. All right. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Children need to be protected not only from the physical harm, but also from the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, the original sins of Adam and Eve. I, uh, children need to be protected. Second point is this, is your life belongs to God. Letter B, your life belongs to God. Turn to the person next to you and say, you do not belong to yourself. We all belong to God. Your life belongs to God. Yet, all, yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. You were God's first, and Satan stole you, and Jesus redeemed you. How we can say praise God for that. First Corinthians six nineteen and 20. Do you not know that your body is the what? Temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not what? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Don't waste your life and don't let anyone else waste your life. I had a friend that... Um, uh, when I first went to Kelso, I think his name was, I can't remember what his name was. I better not say it. <laughs> he might be watching somewhere. <laughs> but he was uh, uh, a friend, of, a good mutual friend of ours brought him in. And I tell you, this guy was so spaced out on like meth and stuff. And he was about ready to get, you know, he, he was on probation. He's about ready to get sent to jail, prison. And uh, while he was, <clears throat> and so I talked with him, I prayed with him, uh, the, my friend brought him into my office, and I, 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 I talked with him, and then he was, he had to go to prison, the police picked him up the next day, and he spent f the next four years in, in prison. And when he got out, he was a brand new person, he had been saved, thoroughly saved. And he wasn't going back to meth. He wasn't going. He used to cook the stuff. And uh, I suppose if I mentioned his name, Lori would probably know who he was. <laughs> Not that she runs in those circles. She just. <laughs> Kelso's a small place. <laughs> just dismiss all of those rumors. But I remember <clears throat> he, he came out uh, and out of prison and he. He, nobody would give him a job, so I was having him do some uh, work around the church. And, uh, um, and I remember all of a sudden he would have these, like, oh, terrible pains and stuff. He'd abused his body so much. And, and you know, one of the first things he did, he started to repent. He said, Lord, forgive me for abusing the temple of the Holy Spirit. Forgive me. For my body is not my own, but it belongs to you. Your body does not belong to you. Your kid's body does not belong to you. 
They belong to God. Your children belong to God, and your life belongs to God. I remember when my daughters were nine years old, and I remember when Vanessa first turned nine, and her birthday happened to be, um, and I figured that was halfway to being 18. And if I didn't mess her up, she was on her own at 18. I was done raising her. I mean, not that I was going to quit. I would still raise her, but I figured you had 18 years to, to get it right. And on her ninth birthday... I remember Janice and I, we were on vacation, we had our two little girls with us, and um, uh, we were up at Lake Tahoe, and it, it wasn't as fabulous as you think it was. We were at a terrible hotel. <laughs> it was, it was flea, but I think Gosnell's cat was there, because <laughs> it was bad. And uh, so, but I remember going out, and they, they promised that this was kind of a luxury hotel, and uh, they made it available to Assembly God pastors, and that should have been our first clue that it was a bad place. <laughs> but instead of the pool, they had a hot tub that was kind of, you know, you, you kind of maybe want to take a shower after you got out of the hot tub. But I remember going out to buy the hot tub, and it was, you know, the one at your house is probably better than this one. And um, But I was out there, and I just remember God impressed upon me, and it was Vanessa's birthday. And I said, God, help me to raise her the way you want her raised. Because when she was a baby, we brought her and we dedicated her to the Lord. We did the same thing with Ashley. When they were just a few days old, we brought them and we dedicated them to the Lord. And God has not taken them back. They belong to him. And I said, Lord, I'm halfway done. Help me. And my girls turned out great. Not because of me and Janice. It's because we gave them to the Lord and he helped us. Sometimes when you're having difficulty with your kids, even when they're grown, just remember, God, I gave them to you. And I know you're going to stay faithful. Do not waste your life or let anyone else waste your life. Mark 10, 13 through 16. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch him. But the disciples rebuked them. And when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the uh, for such is the kingdom for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God will be like a little child and will never enter it. And he took the children into his arms and he put his hands on them and he blessed them. Here's the thing. Point number three is vulnerable. Come to me. Come to me. I couldn't sleep the other morning, so I, I was listening to sermons, and then I happened to found a podcast where Ravi Zacharias was being interviewed, and God bless him, he was one of the greatest apologetics, apologists in the church ever. He just passed away just a few months ago. But he was being... He was being um, uh, interviewed, and I, I don't remember if it was by Dave Rubin or Ben Shapiro. And, and he made a statement that's just really stuck with me. He said this, he said, good is attractive. We're all attracted to good, right? But here's the thing. Evil is seductive. And I uh, kind of struggled with kind of sharing this part. But in the ancient world, they had an idol called Moloch that they would commit child sacrifices to. 
And uh, in the 12th century, uh, Jeremiah 731, uh, 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 Rashi commented on this. And he said, Tophet is Moloch, which is made of brass. And they heated it from its lower parts, and his hands were stretched out, and they were made hot. And they put the child between his hands, and it was burnt. When it vehemently cried out, the priests beat a drum that the father might not hear the voice of his son and his heart not be moved. That's terrible. I mean, I, uh, there was other things that I, in my research, I found out I, I don't even want to, I don't even want to tell you about. But you know, the thing is, is we have the same thing going on today. And everybody is trying to, they're, they're, they may not be beating drums to distract you from what is happening. But it's still going on. And I tell you, man, I'm going to get political here, and I don't mean to, but, I, you know, talk to Janice afterwards. <laughs> but... I believe that we have a legitimate chance to reverse Roe v. Wade. And the devil is going to pull out all the stops. Christian, pray. And believe God and just stand up against all of this. We we can't be we can't turn a blind blind eye to this stuff anymore. Forty four million. And we're we're trying to bring more people into this country. If we would just give birth to the ones that we've aborted. There is there is plenty of room for them. How, how many, how many, I just wonder, like every time, you, you think about that, uh, Aretha Franklin, every time you hear a re record by her, how many people that were just as talented, how many girls that were aborted in the womb that were just as talented as she was? When you see Russell Wilson pass the football, how many Russell Wilsons were aborted in the womb? How many Carl Lewises were aborted? How many Herschel Walkers were aborted? He was a football player. You could go on, you could go with Magic Johnson. You could name, you could name some fantastic black athletes and fantastic black musicians and academics. What's that guy's name? Robert Soul. Uh it just absolutely tremendously brilliant. Yeah. All how how it's it's a tragedy. Mahalia Jackson. Wow. Even even a rape. I mean, I think when a, when a child is conceived, it, it belongs to God. And it is sacred. Stay vulnerable. You are vulnerable to great evil. This verse jumped out to me as I was studying all the verses that had reference to Moloch in Acts is the only reference in the New Testament. Acts 7.39, and this is Stephen's great defense when he was before the Sanhedrin. But our fathers refused to obey him. Instead, they rejected him in their hearts and turned back to Egypt. And then later he says, but 
God turned away and gave them over to the worship of the heavenly bodies. This agrees with what is written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings 40 years in the desert, O house of Israel? You have lifted up the shrine of Moloch and the stars of the god of Rephan and the idols you have made to worship. Therefore, I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. What this is pointed out, Stephen pointed out to the Sanhedrin, they were about ready to stone him. And he said, you're just like your forefathers in the desert. And he was talking about, and he, he basically came out and he accused them of killing Jesus, which they had done. They had plotted to crucify Jesus. And they, they, they heard that and they saw the truth. But they were, it, it's, it's, here's, here's the point that, that the prophet was making that, that Stephen was, they, they heard the truth. They saw the tabernacle of truth. And what did they do? They went through the motions. And how many Christians today are going through the motions? They are just going through the motions of serving God. But in their heart, they have rejected Him. And I don't want to be one of those people. And I don't want to be one of those people that turn a blind eye to what's going on. Because all the time they were wandering through the desert, the prophet said, and said, you were going through the motions, but in your heart you rejected me. Back in your tent, you had your little idol of Moloch and uh, Rephan. And you wanted to go back to Egypt. And you couldn't wait to sacrifice another child. What is the allure of it? Evil is seductive. Satan is a liar and he promised all sorts of crazy, stupid things. But in the end, there's nothing there but bondage. Second point is this, stay vulnerable like a child. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Maybe that's why Satan hates kids so much. You know, I remember Steve and I, when we first started out in the ministry, they used to tell us, they said, hey, you know what? You got to get the teenagers before we lose them to the world. We got we to gotta get them before the needle hits their arms and the bottle hits their lips. We got to get them. You know, I say, yeah, how insidious Satan is. You know where the front line is moved? It's no longer the youth. It's no longer the students. It's the children. We have to stay vulnerable like a child. You notice that Satan was always trying to nip things in the bud. When Moses was, was being conceived and gave birth, what did Pharaoh do being influenced by the Satan? They were, they were throwing kids in the Nile. They were throwing newborn babies. And when Jesus was born, what did, what did, what did Herod do? He went to Bethlehem and slaughtered every child under two years old. Satan has a war against innocence. What do I need to remember about from this whole message? 1 Peter 5, 6 through 7 says, Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time and cast all your anxiety him because he cares for you. Here's what I want you to remember. He cares for you. I got a couple of pictures up here of my grandsons. And my daughter sent this to me. Here's when they first moved to Kodiak, the ones on the right. And there's their little bear whistles. And uh, so uh, they're, th they're the funniest kids in the whole world. I think they're the cutest. You, you might think yours are cuter, but I beg to differ. <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> no, mine are brilliant. They're geniuses. They took after their, mo their grandmother. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> no, I doubt it. 
Yours are pretty smart, too. <laughs> here's, on the first day, here's they are. This is the first day of they, that they ever rode a school bus. You know, they've always been dropped off, or they've never got had a chance or been in a place where they rode a school bus. Dalen is five. He's the one with the fur around his hood. And then Dalen, he dr- or Zephan, he dresses with a fedora. That's how he goes to school. He, he, he's all classy. He's got his rubber boots on because he's in Alaska, but he's always wearing a fedora when he goes to school. So that's my son-in-law, Josiah, and then my daughter back there, and there's uh, Vanessa, and there's the bus coming. And I, I, I gave that to my mom, and I, when, they, to, when they sent that picture to me, I said, hey, I remind them, say, hey, my first time I ever rode a school bus, the school bus driver missed my, uh, missed my stop, and I ended up being the last kid on the bus, and I had to drive all, go to the bus barn. And then he finally, you know, the bus driver took me to my house. And I asked my mom, I said, do you remember that? She goes, oh, yes, I remember that. I, I don't know if she was hoping they would keep me <laughs> or something. <laughs> but then my mom told me a story. See, I, have an older, I had an older brother who passed away when he was 16 and I was 9. But when he was his first school bus ride, my brother was born with club feet. And he had several operations when he was a kid. And he, I didn't notice it because he was my brother, but he kind of walked gimpy and, and, uh, and especially in the cold morning, it took a while to get his legs going. And, uh, but when he went to his first day at school and to ride the bus, the school, te- the, one of the school teacher wouldn't let him get on the, the bus. Wouldn't let him get on the bus. And he missed the bus, and we lived probably about five miles, and it was raining. And he walked home with his gimpy legs in the rain, a first grader. And my mom knew that he should, should have been home, and she got in the car, and she went looking for him, and she found him. And she picked him up, and she took him straight back to the church or school and she found that teacher and she comes in there and said and she she looked at my brother Lyle and she told she told the teacher said look at him he's cold he's wet he's shivering and you're the one that made him miss his bus if you do this again you're going to be in big trouble (laughs) you'd be in big trouble today for that Back in the 60s, they don't really care that much. Here's what I want you to remember. My mom cared for us. You care for your kids. But Jesus, he cares for you. He cares for you. And I know that this has been kind of a heavy, I, this, is, this is heavy on my heart. Because I think if America ever gets one of the what we're going to get judged for the most is we're going to get judged for allowing these abortions to continue on. And I, I'm just praying. I'm just saying, God, give us mercy. But you know, I, I want you to understand this: Jesus cares. For you. Humble yourself and cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. Here's what I want to ask We live in a time when we have anxiety. I'm standing first in line here. So when I heard that. Ginsburg had passed away, and I knew the battle that was coming. My anxiety <laughs> went up to you. Because I know what a battle it's going to be. If you 
are anxious not only about that, but we got a lot of things to be anxious about. We got COVID-19. We got people. We got businesses going out of business. We got this crazy election that's going on. And fires. Pretty soon, floods and landslides. Hurricanes. Earthquakes. Yeah. Are you, are you anxious yet? You know what? If you're anxious, let's as a church, if you're anxious, stand up and let's cast our cares upon him this morning. If you're anxious, if you're anxious about something, cast your cares upon him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your name, God.